Good morning. We are continuing on today in our study of the book of Hebrews. And what we're talking about today is the idea of God's promises and that God keeps better promises uh, than anybody else. And I don't know what it is about promises, but they matter a whole, whole lot to us. We care a lot about promises. It's from a young age. We can't help it. I can tell my children 50, 60, 70 times, get off the couch, don't jump on it, don't hit your sister, use please and thank you, be kind. And I have to repeat myself over and over and over again. But if I casually happen to mention today, hey, maybe next Saturday we'll go get donuts for breakfast. Without fail, Saturday morning, they will be by my bedside, staring me in the face, looking at me and saying, we summon you to fulfill your oath. <laughs> and I'm like, what? how did you hold on to that, but you can't remember to not hit each other? But that's how kids are. And guess what? That's how we are too. We latch on to promises. We want people to do what they say they're going to do. There are things, you're going to go grocery shopping at some point this week, and you will need an essential ingredient for what you're making, and you will forget it. And you will have to go back to the store. But you will remember the, the promise that was broken to you when you were like six or seven years old. And you'll be able to recall it like that. We are a room full of people who have had promises broken to us. And what's more is, we have also done the breaking of the promises as well. And it hurts. In a room this size, there are people who are right now licking the wounds of promises broken to them. Right now. Maybe a, 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 a spouse who failed to live up to the vows that they made, maybe even in this room or the chapel. Maybe you have a, a, a friend who uh, is talking about you behind your back. They promise to be a loyal friend and they're not. Maybe you can recall a, a promotion that you're supposed to get. Your, your employer promised it or a job and you, you didn't get it. It's like you promised. It's like, well, the economy changed or oh, we found a better candidate or oh, we're going to go in a different direction. Broken promises do so much damage. And what happens is when you have so many broken promises, we can't help but wonder if God also is going to stick by his promises. And so what I want us to do today, what I want you to walk away today is I want you to trust God. I want your trust in God to be greater now than, or, or in, in about 30 minutes, I want it to be greater than it was when you walked in here. And I'm going to give you three reasons looking at Hebrews chapter eight, why you should trust God. Why we can trust God's promises. And the first reason is that God makes more reliable promises. God makes more reliable promises. One of the primary components of the Old Covenant. We're basically going to compare the New Covenant and the Old Covenant today. That's what we're doing. And both are founded on promises. So one of the primary components of the, of the Old Covenant, sort of what it revolves around, are three ideas within the sacrificial system. The priests, the sacrifice, and the tabernacle where it takes place. So let's talk about first the priesthood. Look at verse 8 of, he of chapter 8 of Hebrews. Verse 1, sorry, of chapter 8. Now the point in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Jesus is described as a high priest located at the right hand of God in heaven. Now I want you to see what he's doing there. What's he doing? He's seated. He's sitting down. Now if you've been doing our dwell readings with us, which if you're wondering what dwell is, it's uh, we're as a church, we're reading through the Bible, and right now we're reading through the book of Hebrews and the book of Exodus. You can pick up a bookmark if you want to follow along with us. It's right there uh, in the foyer. And if you've been reading along with us in the book of Exodus, you've, you've come upon uh, the building of the tabernacle and God's instructions on how to build the tabernacle. And if you've stuck with it, because it can be some dry reading, congratulations, well done. But notice all the things that are in there. There's a lampstand, there's an altar, there's a, a, a table for certain items, there's a, a thing to burn incense with. You know what's not there? A chair. No chairs. No chairs in the tabernacle. Why? 
Because the priest is supposed to be working. He's supposed to be walking around and doing things. He's supposed to be burning uh, sacrifices and burning incense and keeping the fires going. And he's supposed to be praying and he's supposed to be keeping it clean. It's a bloody, it's a bloody job. And so that has, place has to be kept clean. But Jesus, what's Jesus doing? He's seated. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because his work is done. He's offered one sacrifice, good for all time, his own person, his own life, given for us, for our sin. And it's done, and he can sit down. And you might say, well, Travis, hold on. He still has work to do. What about praying? What about interceding on our behalf? Well, you little Bible scholar, you well done. Because you're right, he is interceding for us. And that gets us to the sacrifice. Skip down to verse 3. We'll pick up verse 2 in a minute. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest, Jesus, also to have something to offer. Jesus offers himself. He offers the sacrifice. Now the reason the sacrifice is necessary is because of sin. And God tells us in his word that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. And so the shedding of blood either needs to be the person who committed the sin, us, or something can interpose itself. So this is the Old Testament sacrificial system. This is why cows and sheep and goats and all sorts of stuff were killed. But Jesus offers himself once and for all. Now, how does this get to the whole intercession thing? But when we think of intercession, we think of God the Father as this angry, wrathful God. And Jesus is like, I'm holding him back, guys. Don't worry. He's not going anywhere. I got him. And he, like, wants to strike us down with lightning, which is just so wrong. It's not a right characterization of who God is. Who do you think sent the Son to die for us? The Father. He wants a relationship with us. But by nature of sin, he's kept at bay. He's kept uh, at an arm's length. He's kept away from us because he can't draw close to sin. So something has to be done. And so Jesus dies. He interposes himself. He intercedes. His blood is the intercession. Now, does Jesus pray for us currently? Yes, he does. There's other passages that talk about this. But this passage, I think, is actually focusing more on the intercessory character of his blood. His blood is standing in between us and the wrath of God. So that when God looks at us, those of us who are believers in Jesus, he doesn't see this failure, this sinner, this broken person. He sees one who has been made righteous in Christ and he can draw close to it. And so Jesus intercedes for us. It's a better sacrifice because it's permanent. We don't have to keep coming in here. There's a reason why this is not a bloody room, despite the color of the carpet. Because Jesus' blood is permanent. Now let's talk about the tabernacle. This is the third component, verse 2. He's a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Skip to verse 4. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. The reason why he's not a priest is because Jesus did not descend from the Levites, okay? He would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. So the tabernacle is this giant tent where the worship of God takes place, okay? Now again, if you've been reading with us in Exodus, you have been absolutely mesmerized by the dimensions of the tabernacle. Good reading, right? This is supposed to be X number of cubits high and this number of cubits wide and the breadth is to be so many cubits and you're like, Lord, I don't know what a cubit is. I don't know if you know this, Lord, but we're Americans. We don't do the metric system, and we don't do the cubit system either. Give it to me in feet and yards. It's about a foot and a half as a cubit. And you think God is just being exacting. Why is God doing this? Well, the reason why God is, we find out here, the reason why God is being so precise is apparently in some way, the best way I can understand it is, this is like a to-scale model of the courtroom, the throne room of God. It's a scale model. And Moses is being instructed to build it a certain way so that the worship of God can take place in a copy of the heavenly throne room. So hopefully you see how much better, how much more reliable this promise is. Jesus, who is a better priest, who offers a better sacrifice, is not in a copy of a place. 
He is in the actual throne room. If I were to offer you two paintings, I said you could have either one. This one is an authentic Van Gogh. This one is a copy that I made of the painting. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Take the authentic one. It's a better choice. You want the real thing, not the copy. The real thing is more valuable. Now, I will say this. The new covenant is way better. But there is one component about the old covenant that we find attractive. And it's because we live in a post-enlightenment society. We are an empirical society. We want to see things done. We want to hear things done. We want proof. That's one of the ways that we can trust people. And we know people are going to break their promises. So we see that we want to see them do things, right? So in the old covenant system, you would bring your animal. You would see the animal. You would see the priest sacrifice it. You would see the priest who's doing it. And you would hear the priest say, your sins are forgiven. That sounds really nice. Do you ever wonder if you're actually forgiven? It'd be really nice to have somebody be like, yeah, oh, you're good. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. And in the new covenant system, do we see our priest? No, he's in heaven. Do we see the sacrifice? No, it's 2,000 years ago. Unless some of y'all are really old. Nope. And do we see him interceding for our behalf? Do we see this heavenly temple? No. We don't see any of it. And some of us... Most of us, if you've had a promise broken to you, it's likely been broken to you when you haven't been able to keep tabs on the other person. You thought you could trust your spouse, and what was going on on the side was something you didn't know about. You thought you could trust your employer, and the whole time they were telling you, great job, you're doing good, we really appreciate your work, they were working on laying you off. You thought you could trust maybe a friend, And you find out the whole time, like I said, they're just gossiping about you behind your back while you weren't there. And so we really have this hard time trusting the promises of people when they're not around us. We've got to keep tabs on them. I mean, how many of us check the phones of our partners or our spouses, significant others, looking at them and being like, who are you texting? Who are you calling? What are you looking at? I don't trust you. And what happens is, because there are people that we don't trust, and because people are made in the image of God, guess what happens? We wonder whether we can trust God. We can't see him. We don't know what he's really doing. He might tell us one thing in his word and might really be thinking something else. How can we trust him? And it is because you have to believe. You have to believe that God makes more reliable promises. You have to trust him. You have to take that step, that confidence that God is one who does not break promises. And so we can trust him. And so that actually gets us to another question, talking about God not breaking promises. Because God does make unbreakable promises. That's the next reason why we can trust him. God makes unbreakable promises. See, we have a problem. And the problem is this. If you can think for a second about promises, you typically don't make a newer and better promise unless your old promise was broken, right? That's the way it works. Look, for instance, at verse 6 of chapter 8. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it's enacted on what? Better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. On the day when I took them out of, by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. You don't have to make a new promise unless the old promise is broken, right? If I tell my son, daughter, I'm going to come to your, your, your baseball game, I'm going to come to your softball game, I'm going to come to your recital, I don't have to make that promise if I've come to the last 30. It's an assumed quantity. But if you have to be like, no, 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 I promise. This time I'm going to be here. That's the promise of somebody who has failed to live up to promises in the past. So does God break his promise? Is God somebody who's breaking his promise and he's making it up to us with a better covenant? So rather than, are you coming to the baseball game? I'm going to come to the baseball game and then I'll take you to ice cream after. So we're going to have a better promise. Well, here's the thing. The author agrees that there's something going on. There's a problem. Notice what he says in verse 7. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. The author agrees. Yeah, there's something wrong. 
And what's interesting is that God is the one who finds the fault with it. He's the one that has an issue. Look at verse 8. For he finds fault with them when he says. Now the with them is an interpretive decision that the ESV has made. It's not clear whether it's he is fault, finds fault with them or he finds fault with it. And so it could be that God, and probably likely God is finding fault both with the people and with the way the old covenant is set up. God has an issue with it. The old covenant, the reason why it's broken is because the people with which the covenant was made couldn't keep the promises. This is why the author quotes Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. That's what verse 8 and the rest of the chapter pretty much is about. There is a need for a new covenant because in the old covenant, notice what it says at the end of verse 9, they could not or did not continue in my covenant. They couldn't keep it. They couldn't keep the agreement. You see, the agreement was, if you do what I tell you to do, I will bless you. If you don't do what I tell you to do, I will curse you. And that's the way it was supposed to work. And that's the way it was supposed to work forever with, with this relationship with Israel. But there's a problem. They couldn't do it. And in fact, when Jeremiah writes this, guess what's wrong? Jeremiah is writing this in the middle of the fall of the kingdom of Judah, the last Jewish kingdom on earth. That's it. They're being sent to exile because they couldn't keep the promise. Now, there's a misconception that we have about the old covenant, the old system, is that it's works-based and the new covenant is grace-based and that's why it's better. That's not right. I know what I just said sounds works-based, but you're starting at the wrong point. The old covenant started with grace. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were all chosen by grace. They were chosen by God. They did nothing for it. In fact, God brings it up all the time to Israel. I didn't pick you because you were the biggest, you were the smartest, you are the most technologically advanced, you were the most artistic. I picked you because I picked you. And then he brings them out of Egypt, not by anything that they did. They just cry out to him and he delivered them. And for Israelites, for Jewish people, that's their salvation event. That's their Easter. That's their uh, uh, Good Friday. And so after God brings them out of slavery... He brings them into the wilderness and he says, okay, this is how we now interact. I've saved you by grace. Now this is how you respond to me in obedience. Here's the law. Boom, 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 boom. They've already gotten the salvation of getting out of Egypt. He's not going to send them back to Egypt. It's the same thing for us. We've been delivered from slavery to sin by grace through faith. And now how do we respond? By obedience. In loving obedience. So you see that God doesn't break his promise. You say, well, well, Travis, how did they break a promise? If God's the one that made it, how did the people break the promise? Well, let me go back to the baseball example. Let's say your dad says, hey, I'm going to come see your baseball game, your softball game, whatever. And I want to see you play baseball. I want to see you do the sport. Okay. And so he works with you. You're fielding ground balls, you're practicing hitting, stealing bases, everything. And the day the game comes and your dad shows up, but you're not there. And come to find out, you don't really like baseball. Which, what's wrong with you? It turns out you don't like baseball. You don't like standing in the heat. You don't like getting dirty. You don't like somebody throwing a really hard object at you. You're like, I just don't like baseball. And so rather than tell your dad this, you just don't show up. You realize your father is incapable of fulfilling the promise that he made to you. He can't come see you play baseball because you're not there to play. This is what happens with the Israelites. They repeatedly not show up. God is there. He wants to bless them. He wants to fulfill his promise. But he can't because the Israelites aren't continuing in the covenant. They're not showing up to play ball. And this is not an Israelite problem. This is not a God problem. This is a humanity problem. We have a nature inside of us, a sin nature, that drives us to do the things that we want to do, overriding commitments that we've made. I guarantee you, and I, I threw this out in the last service, it might be a little high, but I think like 75 to 90% of all promises made at the moment they're made, people genuinely intend to follow through. I think very few people get married and in the back of their head thinking to themselves, can't wait to cheat on this person. I'm really good, planning on sticking, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be good at this. But it's an external promise that's made. And then there's an internal desire. There's a lust for somebody else. Or there's a desire for a different candidate. 
Or there's the friend group that they really want to be a part of and they can be good friends with that person. All they got to do is throw you under the bus. They want to be a good friend, but they, in that moment, there's this desire. You see what happens is, and this is what happened to the Israelites. The Israelites were just as rebellious when they received God's law as they were before they ever left Egypt. It didn't change anything about their hearts. It was an external law on an internal heart. And so when their desires would override the desire to do God's will. And it's the same thing when people make promises to us. The desire in the moment overrides our desire to do God's will. And you know what? We all have people that have broken promises to us. Spouses, kids, parents, employers. But you know maybe the worst one of all to feel like this lets you down is if you feel like God has let you down. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, Travis, you don't understand. I get the whole like not following God's commands thing, but I've really been doing what I'm supposed to do. I come to church. I'm in the word. I do the dwell reading. I've got the bookmark. I'm in. I'm faithful in prayer. And you don't understand. Like I'm in the middle of a maelstrom. I've got cancer or some kind of disease. I've got, I've, I've lost my job. I've got kids who are rebelling. Against, I brought them up in church. I did the thing. I brought them to all, they did the the camp stuff. And they couldn't care less about God. How can you tell me that God is faithful to maintain his promises? Well, remember, we're reading a quotation from the book of Jeremiah. You know what Jeremiah's nickname is? It's the weeping prophet. Dude is just really sad. You know why he's sad? He has every right to be. From a very young age, he was a prophet. And pretty much God tells him right at the gate, you're going to be my prophet and literally nobody is going to listen to you. Like, imagine getting hired for a job and being told you're going to fail. Thanks, no thanks, I'll keep looking. But God gets, gets this guy, and Jeremiah does everything he's supposed to do. He proclaims God's truth, he talks about it all the time, and guess what happens? Nobody listens. Not only does nobody listen, they beat him, they throw him in a well, or like a cistern, they throw him in a pit, which, not as glamorous as Daniel and the lions did. Daniel got lions. We all talk about that, we don't talk about Jeremiah in the pit. He's uh, uh, threatened all the time. And then you know how Jeremiah's story ends? Exactly what he prophesies happens. Judah gets hauled off into exile. Guess where Jeremiah goes? He gets hauled off by a bunch of slavers and taken down to Egypt. And that's the last we hear of him. We have no idea what happens to Jeremiah after that. He's fully faithful to God. And that's what happens to him. And so he writes this book called Lamentations, which he has every right to write. And in chapter 3, verse 16, he is talking to God and he says, He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. That's where some of y'all are today. And so I say my endurance has perished, so my, has my hope from the Lord. And then he starts talking to God. He says, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it. He can't get it out of his head and is bowed down or bowed down within me. But then he says, this is how he has hope. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Now, I'm making an interpretive decision myself here, but that's not read with a whole lot of passion. That is read by somebody who knows what the truth is, and he's going back to it. I feel this way. I feel all this anguish, but I'm going to remember things to hold on to my hope. God doesn't break his promises. I'm going to trust him, and I'm going to trust him because his steadfast love never ceases. I'm going to trust him because his mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. I'm going to trust him because his faithfulness is great. I'm going to trust him because he's my portion. And I'm going to trust him because I'm going to trust him. And that's how you respond. When you feel like God is letting you down, you do exactly what Jeremiah did. You confront him. You say, God, remember my state. I'm in an awful state. And then you say, but I'm still going to trust you. I'm still going to trust you. And here's why. God makes more reliable promises. He makes unbreakable promises. But here's the big one. He makes better promises. God just makes better promises. We're going back to chapter 8. 
And he's, Jeremiah is going to tell us exactly how this new covenant is going to work, why it's going to be so much better. And the first thing he tells us is we're getting new hearts. In verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. You see, the old covenant was written on what? What did what God write the old covenant on? Stone. And in Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel 36... God tells Israel that I'm going to change out your hearts. I'm going to take away your heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. And we read that and think, oh, you're talking about hard-heartedness. That's part of it. But remember, the external law is written on hard stone tablets. But the new covenant is going to be written on soft hearts that are ready to receive it. Ready to know. And it's not just knowing what God wants. That's no different than the old covenant. There's a desire to do God, God's will. To do what God wants. It changes us. It's that change of heart. You need a new heart to play baseball. You need a new heart to follow God. Moving on. Verses 10 and 11. It says, and they, at the end it says, I'll be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. This is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. We know him because we draw close to him. And the Spirit of God is what allows us to drive, draw close. He prays for us as well. You see, in the Old Covenant, the, the Holy Spirit would come upon people for moments of important tasks, like Samson or David. But then you know what happens? He leaves again. But in the New Covenant, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, to dwell in you. And He remains there. He didn't leave so you can draw close to the Lord. You can know that his promise is better because he's with you at all times. And then lastly, verse 12, probably my favorite part. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I'll remember their sins no more. Look, even in the new covenant, there's still that fleshly desire to do what we want. We still desire to break our promises. We say, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. But this thing over here looks really, really great. And we wind up giving in to that temptation. We follow after that thing. And you know what happens? Because the Holy Spirit's living inside of us, and because God has given us better problem, promises, we can go back to him and say, Lord Jesus, I messed up. And he says, I know. I forgive you. And you can confess and you can repent because he's a better priest with a better sacrifice in a better place. And so that forgiveness is always there for us. You don't abuse it by just doing whatever you want and getting a free pass. No, no, no. But you go in confession. But here's the thing. Many of us are living by old covenant rules. And I don't mean you have like an altar in your backyard where you're sacrificing chickens. You could try it. I'm sure that would violate several local ordinances. Maybe your HOA. I'm actually confident your HOA says nothing about sacrificing animals. You could give it a shot and just see if you could get them to change it. I don't know. I like how uncomfortable everybody is at the thought of sacrificing an animal in their backyard. You're still uncomfortable. It's okay. What I mean by that is, what I mean by you sacrificing and, and, and following the old covenant is that you're still expecting, you're still waiting for God to fulfill promises to you. Not realizing that, that his promises are already fulfilled in Christ. You see, at the end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, my wife described it to me this way. I think she had a professor describe it to me this way. It's the end of the Old Te Testament. And it's like a couple that is on the verge of a divorce. And they've been married for a long time. And God and Israel are looking at each other wondering, how did it get to be so bad? Israel's blaming God, saying, God, you didn't fulfill your promises. You dragged us into exile. You said you were going to bring us back. And you did, but it's not like it was. And God's like, guys, what do you expect? I told you this is exactly what would happen. And so there's this friction between the people and between God. And some of us are right there. Some of you are standing at an arm's length from God and you've walked through a season of broken promises and you're like, God, I just... You said it was going to get better and it hasn't. You said you were going to be faithful and it doesn't seem like you are. And you're standing there waiting for God to reach out to you and he's standing, staring back at you being like, you've got to trust me more. You've got to trust me again. You know what we need? We need a change of heart. We need a change of heart. Some of us, the reason why you, haven't, you can't trust God is because you've never trusted him. 
You've never trusted him at all. You've never put your faith in him. You've never trusted in his death, his burial, and resurrection. You've never given him your life. And so the prospect of trusting God with other things, like your work or your school or anything like that, it's just foreign to you. You never do that. With your marriage, never. With your relationships, no. So maybe today you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to receive that new heart. And for those of us who have trusted the Lord, maybe you're standoffish from him right now. Maybe God does seem far away. I've, I've, I've had a couple weeks here where I just my desire to spend time with the Lord has been very small. I haven't wanted to spend time with him. Just my passion for it has just kind of grown cold. And I've realized this. I've just, and to be honest with you, it's just I've wanted to do other things with my time. I didn't say that, right? It's just other things that seem more appealing. And so this week, and I think it was last week's sermon, it just kind of really convicted me. And, and so I was like, Lord, I can't warm the fires of my heart again. That's something you have to do. And so I started doing the dwell readings. Not that I hadn't been doing them, but I started doing them with a little more intentionality, a little more journaling, a little more spending some time reading some other commentators and stuff like that, just really trying to dive in. And those fires started to warm up. The embers started to burn again. And he was so faithful to meet with me. And he would be faithful to meet with you as well. Let him warm your cold heart with himself. Look, relationships are built on trust. And you cannot build trust with another person, whether it is God or anybody else, unless you spend time with them. Ernest Hemingway said, the best way to find out whether you can trust someone again is to trust them. And so maybe you need to know whether you can trust God to trust him for real this time. And so one of the things that we've been doing as we've been talking about the dwell readings is, is there's people in our church doing the dwell readings and it's shaping them, it's molding them. And so I'm going to invite my friend Wayne uh, Moore up to the, the pulpit here and he is going to share with us, I'm going to ask him some questions, and he's going to share with us how God has worked in the, reading the dwell readings. Uh, and so Wayne, it's fun, we, we became friends this week. We actually are, uh, we had lunch this week, and then we didn't realize we were doing this, so uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. So Wayne, how are you? Good, Greg. Good, good to see you. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then uh, we'll, we'll start talking about Dwell. Sure. I'm originally born and raised in Macon, Georgia. I got an electrical engineering degree from Georgia Tech and uh, moved out to California with Hewlett Packard. Got back to Texas as quick as I could and uh, started the singles ministry here at uh, Park Cities. Had the good pleasure of meeting my beautiful wife here and married her in the Ellis Chapel. Uh, we had our son here and went to a number of different uh, service and other activities here at the church and have enjoyed it that entire time. Had a long and, and uh, glorious career with Hewlett Packard and had a chance to take early retirement in uh, January of 2010. Uh, continued here at the church until uh, recently when my wife died in May of 2022 and the church has been an incredible gift of blessings for me. And I would like the record to show that I was not the singles minister here <laughs> when Wayne was in singles ministry. I know I've been here a while, but not that long. So Wayne, tell me a little bit about how the dwell readings have impacted your life and shaped you over the, over the time we've been doing them. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I guess one of the things to me has been that in times past when we've had Bible readings that have been offered up to the church and otherwise, they've tended to start in the Old Testament, which to me is a hard read. Um, one of the things that has been a blessing to me about the <clears throat> dwell readings has been they have a good mixture of both old and new, but also the size has been what I'd call digestible. It's something that the, the individual readings are not too small, not too large, they're just right. And for me, that's been an incredible help in keeping me focused and keeping me reliable in going to it each day. Uh, another aspect of it is that, as we've seen here today, um, the dwell readings have been complementary to what we've been hearing as the sermons each week. And for me, that's allowed me to get my heart and my mind in a better place to hear and, and hopefully act on what I hear each week. Um, and maybe not lastly, but I think that the fact this is a church-wide activity that we've been having going on, and the fact that we oftentimes have related our learnings in the Sunday school classes, I view it a little bit like uh, playing golf. I'm not a very good golfer at all, but I can play uh, scramble. In other words, somewhere along the way, I can make a contribution. And even though my biblical learning is just a fraction of what many of the people I know is like. 
Um, I feel like at least at some point along the way, I can discover and share and get excited about something that not only benefits me, but benefits the group at large. And I can, I can testify to that, because like I said, we had lunch this week, and it was the most life-giving lunch that I had. I mean, it, it really was wonderful to spend time with Wayne and, and get to know him and just to hear about how God has been faithful. And that comes from spending time with the Lord. I don't know that we necessarily talked about any specific thing with Dwell, but you could just tell spending time with somebody who has spent time with God. And so it encouraged me and nourished me. So Wayne, thank you for, for sharing with us. I'm going to pray for you and uh, we'll continue on our service. Father God, thank you uh, so much for Wayne. Thank you for his uh, devotion to your word, his faithfulness uh, to you and to our church. And Lord, I pray uh, that his testimony here today uh, encourages people and challenges people uh, to pick up the word of God and to see that they genuinely can trust you uh, because you make better promises and they're unbreakable and they're reliable and we can trust you. And so God, thank you for his testimony. Thank you for his life. Pray you bless him and bless each person in this room. It's in your son's name. Amen. So you might be wondering, what do I do from here? And you might need a new heart. You might recognize, you know what, Travis, I'm that person that has never trusted the Lord. And I need to know how to do that today. You can come talk with me, other pastors in the foyer. I'd love to speak with you there. Maybe you want to show that you trust the Lord and God's been working on you about maybe joining the church like some of those folks did up there. Or you want to come get baptized. That's a great way to show that you trust the Lord. You can talk to us about that as well back in the narthex. If you want to talk to us about anything, you're struggling to trust God, you need prayer. We'd love to meet with you there. Stephen's going to close with, I think, Because He Lives. We're going to sing that together and then we'll be done for the day.